So how's everybody doing? Amen. Wow, the lyrics to the songs were so appropriate for, for this week that we're going to celebrate uh, uh, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the meantime, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 21 that you're going to see up on the screen. If not, you can, if you prefer to use your Bible and or your device, it's Matthew 21. We're going to start at verse 1. Amen. This particular passage and this particular event, uh, otherwise known as the triumphal entry, is recorded in each of the four Gospels. So it's one of the few events that actually you will find in all of the different uh, Gospels that were written, written by uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. This one is in Matthew's uh, uh, chapter 21. And it, uh, if you don't mind standing with me as we read from 1 to 11, just to show we can show honor to God's word. It is God's word, amen? amen. So um, thank God it's, it's God's word. Um, I don't want it to be my words for sure. But I will do everything in my power and by God's grace to try and explain to you what I think to be a, a fascinating situation here. Um, there's some irony here uh, in that uh, uh, we mentioned a moment ago um, Jesus is triumphing, but he's going to do so according to his terms. Uh, no one dictates to him what he is or when he'll do what he does. He does what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants, and for his own purposes. When the sooner we learn that, the better off we are. And of course, that's the big lesson of that day. So it says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem... Uh, they, and came to Bethphage, to the uh, Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place. To fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the, fo the foal of a beast, a burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and sat on them. That is, he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowd that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is, the, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. We're going to stop right there. And, uh, well, let's pray for the sermon. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing this morning. We ask for uh, freedom in the Holy Spirit, Lord, to, uh, to be able to share, Lord, and to explain and to understand uh, what's going on here in this passage, Lord. Uh, uh, everything, uh, Lord, that said, everything that we think about and that we contemplate this morning we pray lord that it will lead us to one conclusion and that is that jesus is that king that we're waiting for and that he came to fulfill the purposes he came uh lord to uh complete the plan of salvation for our benefit and we thank you for that lord so many things going on at that time as they are going on in our time. But help us always, Lord, to see through the fog and help us always to see through the chaos uh, what you're doing. And uh, ultimately, it all leads back to him, to, to our king and to his kingdom. And we just thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I'm going to focus on the last two verses. If you want to move over there to verse, uh, oh, you got it up already, I think, verse, verse uh, 9 and 10, now 10 and 11. Uh, it says, and when he had entered Jerusalem, uh, referring to Jesus, amen, the whole city was stirred up. There was a commotion saying, who is this? 
And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So I'm going to focus on those two verses to try to draw us into what's going on here this morning. And guess what? It is a great question. Given what had just happened, what they had witnessed. The crowds uh, had said correctly, this, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's true, he's a prophet. As a matter of fact, he's actually the, capital T-H-E, prophet, capital P, uh, the one that Moses had spoken about thousands of years earlier that would appear on Israel's national scene. And it's true that he's from Nazareth of Galilee. So they got the geography right. That's, that's a good start, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> forgive me um, because yes he's a prophet yes he's from Nazareth yes they got that part right obviously they understood from having heard him and of course you know he, he was from Nazareth but you know what there's a problem here as we're going to see uh, their answer is partially true it's lacks the answer lacks the full weight of his personhood. Let me put it that way. He's more than a prophet. Much more than a prophet. He's much more than they could ever imagine appeared and visited them that day. And Jesus is always much more than what we could ever imagine. From that day that we were able to say yes to the, to the cross, from that day that we moved toward him and drew near to him and he to us, of course, that's how that works. Jesus is always more than we could ever imagine or comprehend. And that was true then. Uh, you see, Israel at that particular time was spiritually blind. And uh, uh, its leaders were morally corrupt. And there's so much going on in the, quote, religious sphere in the religious content text uh, they they didn't understand and uh, sadly they they had no idea to the magnitude of who this man that was entering into Jerusalem really really was you see one of the struggles for the Jews and for uh, those that study the Old Testament uh, even the theologians of the day w was the idea of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. When you look at the scriptures in this particular passage where uh, we see Matthew telling us that this is that which the prophet spoke of, his entrance, and how he would enter, uh, Zechariah, it, it only mentions the first part of his coming. The very next verse in Zechariah 9.10, it talks about him coming as a conquering king. But in, the ver in Zechariah 9.9, 9, which we read here today, he comes as a humble servant, although he's the king. But they wanted the second part to be fulfilled. See, they were looking for someone to conquer Rome, who was oppressing them. Who is this man? Well, he's the prophet that arrived at the prophesied time. Isn't that encouraging? God wrote history in advance. That's who we serve. We write a God who writes history before it happens. And not only writes it, he controls it. And so this is no accident. This is exactly as it was planned to be. So here comes Jesus uh, from Nazareth, this prophet in their minds, the son of a carpenter, as we know. He was raised in this insignificant um, uh, town of Nazareth. Um, he would gain the favor of, of many people. Uh, he would be cheered and praised, as we read. Uh, but, and, and taking uh, the whole story, I'm just kind of, summarizing it so he would be cheered and he would and he would be praised and he was recognized uh, his fame had gone throughout all the land they, they, they had heard of him but this very same one that they would lay down their uh, cloaks and wave their palm branches in honor 
kind of like the red carpet treatment. He would soon be mocked at the end of the week. He'd be scorned. He would be thrown aside and crucified. And the cheering would end. We're going to ask ourselves the question, well, how does something change so fast? Right? And then we find a little bit about human nature uh, as we look at this story, uh, that particular Palm Sunday, Jesus bravely enters into Jerusalem knowing what is ha- going to happen. He knows exactly. That's why when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, there were tears of blood streaming down his forehead. He knew uh, the passion that he would suffer. And he was aware of of uh, as he approached Jerusalem, that there were things going on uh, uh, around him, the condition of the people. He knew about the Roman occupation. More importantly, uh, again, and I'm just going to summarize, and I'm going to dig a little bit further in a minute. He also knew the condition of the people's hearts. And he also was aware of their spiritual bankruptcy. So he knows things. They know things. The Jews, the Jews again. Uh, they were under heavy Roman oppression. Um, they were burdened by heavy taxes. Something we know a little bit about today. Do you know that inflation is actually another way to tax? It's another tax on, 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 a, on us who live in this economy. They were burdened by restrictions. Here the Israel living in their land, but the Rome is, controls it. So... Um, you know, there was a cruel system of laws. And matter of fact, these were pagans for, you know, you know, for Israel, God's people. These are pagans occupying their territory, telling them how to live, where to go, what to do, when to do it, paying heavy taxes. So Jesus knew all about this when he shows up to Jerusalem, don't you suppose? Right? Uh, he knew all about what their situation was. But more importantly, he knew what their spiritual condition was. And let me talk about that for a little bit. He knew their hearts. So here's the conflict. They expected and desired a king, a conqueror, someone who's going to set them free, as I just mentioned. And uh, they had waited a long time since the last prophet. Malachi, what, 400 years had passed before Jesus shows up. So it's a period of silence and anticipation. Uh, you know, like, where, where's God when you need him? You know what I mean? I mean, that's the reality. Amen? I'm just trying to set the background here so we can understand the, how, how amazing this is and what happens. So, uh, you know, they, they, um, they understood and had been waiting for a promised Messiah. They were waiting for the one... Uh, That was referred to in the Garden of Eden that would crush the head of the serpent. They were looking for the seed promised to Abraham and the eternal king that God spoke to David that would one day sit upon his throne. And all of the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of him. So you have to remember, they got this, if you just go to Old Testament, right, and just like grab it. It occupies a big portion of the, of the scriptures and all of those things in there, they, they're waiting, they're expecting this Messiah, this deliverer, this liberator to show up and, and, uh, and he did, except he didn't show up like they thought he would, you know. You see, um, they had heard of his mighty works. If you got the four Gospels, if you go through them, uh, I'm kind of doing a whole summary of everything. And to be honest with you, I, I think it's important. Uh, they had witnessed him restoring sight to the blind. Uh, they saw evidence of him healing the lame, those that were paralyzed. He fed the multitude, the 5,000 at one time, with a little boy's lunch and the leftovers to spare. I like leftovers. How about you? Right? Take it to lunch the next day. Or give it to Sammy, right? That's how it works around our place, you know. He'll eat it. And they they had heard uh, recently, this is now more closer to the entrance. Every here's heard about the triumphal entry, right? Raise your hand if you heard this story before. Good, good, good. Uh, You know what had happened right before that? When he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So now it's a peak 
It's, it's a moment, a climax. Wow, he not only hears uh, our, uh, and teaches us, and not only does he feed the multitude and, and heal the sick and the blind see and the lame walk, but now he's raising people from the dead. We really, and now here he's going to Jerusalem. Let's see if we can catch a glimpse of him. Right? You guys see how that's building up? So here comes Jesus. This one that they had heard him teach, and he at one point had said, oh man, uh, the people had said of Jesus, well, he sure teaches with a lot more authority than our own teachers teach, our rabbis, of course, because he wasn't corrupt like they were. They were listening to the one who is the Word, and the Word was in the beginning, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. They were speaking to the one, and so the timing's right. And by the way, this particular time, it's Passover. Did you, did you know that, Eddie? Passover time. He's going to have that Lord's Supper that, that they're celebrating Passover. So it's a huge ceremony, a feast. And, and everybody goes up to Jerusalem for Passover. Everybody does that. They come from all the nations. And uh, it said that millions uh, would come to Jerusalem for Passover. Right? It's the right time. Jesus is, is, is going to enter into Jerusalem and he's going to throw off the shackles and the chains of Rome and we're going to be free to live in this utopia that we dreamed of with our Messiah. you know. And uh, so that's what they're expecting. Yeah. What is it about us even today what becomes so evident is lack of leadership more so. I mean, our desire today is God just sent us someone that actually cares about us and not themselves. You know, do you ever notice there's a lack of leadership? Oh my God, what are we going to do? Russia invaded Ukraine. Oh, huh. let's not get them too angry. <laughs> they got nuclear weapons. Yeah, but so do we. But, you know, it's a whole nother mentality now. Leadership. Lack of leaders. They were looking for because the leaders they had were weak and corrupt. You know, and I'm, I'm just trying to get it, wrap my mind around, uh, well, yeah, they're, they're anticipating, they're expecting someone to set things right. Right? Yeah. So they had heard about him, and uh, there he goes. And the, the Rome a, is a big problem. And uh, maybe this, this is the one that's going to make, make it work for us. And so Jesus appears. He knows that's the situation. Uh, they, they tested him on a number of events. Like, for instance, what they, he was traveling one time with his disciples. And they had to pay a, a duty tax to pass from one region to another. You know, like, like, like good governments do. They, you got to pay taxes for everything, you know. You, know, you get paid taxes for your income. And then you, when you go to shop, you get to pay taxes for your new shoes. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Didn't you tax? Didn't my money already tax? And now you're taxing it again. But that's what's going on with them. They, they were tired of it. They felt the burden of it. And so they're thinking, finally, someone's going to bring in this, this kingdom that was promised to David. And, and, and it, might, it could very well be Jesus. And guess what? Jesus knows all that. But you know what he knew also? That their hearts were bankrupt. He knew that they needed a savior. He knew that they needed someone to redeem them. And that they needed to be reconciled back to the father. Restore relationship that had been broken by their sins. And so he appears as the one who the Old Testament identifies as the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, because on him would fall the iniquity of us all. But that's not who they're waiting for. And by the way, the Roman soldiers during the Passover, they also knew something as well. They also knew that uh, uh, traditionally, at, at around this period, there would be skirmishes and violent uh, uh, mobs because there were always these guys that would conspiracy theorists that they had. Barabbas was one of them, by the way. 
he was a he he was arrested because he he had murdered someone. He was a murderer, and yet he was uh, you know provoking a riot to overthrow uh, uh, Rome. So it wasn't new, but maybe there'd be someone that finally could actually do it. And so the Roman soldiers and the Roman leadership was also somewhat on edge because they had already been warned by Caesar to keep things in check or they would see Herod and, 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 uh, and um, um, Pilate would lose their position. So they had the pressure coming from, from, from corporate office, you know, from Rome. Uh, keep things in, in check down there, by the way. It's that those crazy religious fanatics they're going to have that celebration pass something. But what's that called again? Passover. Oh, yeah, that. They're, so all of the, so you can see all the different angles and all the different people and their different perspectives and, and expectations. And so, uh, so Jesus rides into Jerusalem knowing all this. And uh, the crowds, uh, they wave their palm branches. And, of course, palm branches is a national uh, a practice for uh, nationalism, if you would. They shouted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're cheering and, and praising and they're exalting him. But then something happened, as I told you earlier. Things didn't go like they expected. Right? What, what were they expecting? They were they're like, where are the troops? You know? Um... He didn't lead a revolution. I, I thought we were going to revolt here. <laughs> you know, get rid of these, these clowns. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. And, and I, I hope at this moment, that then you see at verse 10, when they, the whole city is stirred up. So I just told you for like the last 10 minutes why the city was stirred up. Wouldn't you want to know why it was stirred up? Yeah. Who is this? Let me put it to you this way. He's the Messiah they never expected. He's the Messiah they really didn't know. And he's the Messiah they didn't want. And he's the Messiah they would reject. Right? They, they have a bigger problem, and Jesus is aware of it. Their, their problem is not Rome. Their problem is sin. And what they want to do is escape their immediate temporal uh, circumstances and have their brand of peace. And because of that, they miss the very fact that in their very presence, riding into Jerusalem was the Prince of Peace. You see, you can ask for something that you want on your terms. See, we all have, I think, sometimes the danger of Creating an agenda for Jesus about what we want for our lives. Um, Pastor, do you have to go there? <laughs> we don't let Jesus be who he is. There's so many, and if you were to ask, and this is one of the great questions if you like to have, if you have an evangelist heart, is uh, one way to strike up the conversation with someone about our faith and, and get into, like, you know, talking and sharing about Jesus is just ask someone, hey, who do you think Jesus is? And oh my goodness, you will have a thousand different answers. But who is this, they're asking. And I would like, as a pastor, to be able to take the Bible that we have now and, and, and take the scriptures that we just read and explain to you who this is. Not who I want them to be, not what I expect them to do, what I wish and desire. Do you see the problem here? We do it. So it's kind of something that I... Um, the idea came to me one day from a book from Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew, and he addressed this issue. I serve, or I will serve the Jesus I want, Leo, but not the Jesus that is. The big difference, isn't there? <laughs> I, we want to make Jesus a cosmic butler. You know, he's going to come, he's going to come with a plate. You know, and just serve up whatever it is we want and how, whenever we want it, however we want it. Hey, make sure it's medium rare, you know. We, 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 we want, gosh, I'm afraid to say it because I don't want anybody to get discouraged. But sometimes we want like Jesus to pluck grapes and literally hand feed us. You know, because that's, that's cool, you know. And make sure they're refrigerated. I like my grapes cold and chilled. You know, the Jesus 
they wanted didn't appear. Oh, he will appear. And I'll get to that in a minute. Just leave that hanging for a second. He's not what they expected. But you see, the Jesus that came, came to be the Jesus that delivers. And what he came to deliver them from was their biggest problem. And it's sin, which would separate us from God eternally if it's not dealt with. He came to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And they didn't get it. They didn't see it. Because they were blinded. And they wanted their brand of peace. And like I said, the very Prince of Peace was standing before them. So verse 4 says, they took him, this took place, that is what Jesus asked and how Jesus came into the city. It took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, these are the Jews, behold, and notice, and you can underline it, your king, your king is what? Is coming to you. Oh, Isaiah, uh, Zechariah said this in chapter 9.9. 9. Okay, uh, our, our king is coming. Our king is coming to us. Wow. And how is he coming? Humble. In, in, in what form would we have specifically uh, 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 to know and what evidence would there be for us to be sure it's the right one? The right king, the right king. Uh, he's going to be mounted on a donkey. Huh? On a what? On a donkey and uh, uh, it says on a colt, the, the foal of a beast of burden. Yeah, interesting to me, just a note, uh, I could probably just pass by it real quick, but Jesus rides on a beast of burden when he will become the one who carries the burden of our sins. Isn't it appropriate? And he, it just, is it just me or am I making it up? He, he rides on an animal that's to carry burdens, our burdens, and yet he will become the sacrifice, the lamb that will carry our burdens. I just find it uh, symbolically significant. He's coming to carry our burdens, riding in on a beast of burden. And this animal is not a threat to anyone. I don't know if you've been around donkeys. Obviously, you don't want to stand behind them and annoy them. But a donkey would probably not be much of a threat if a whole army came in on donkeys. Rather, we expect an army, a conquering army, to come in riding on a, on a stallion, better yet. But that's not what happens. You see, again, he's not coming in like they thought. And, and, and what's interesting, it says there that this took place to fulfill what was spoken of the prophet. See, it happened to fulfill what God's plan was for humanity. It fulfills what the prophet said. And that Jesus knows what they want. But Jesus doesn't come to give them what they want. He comes to give them what they need. Isn't that amazing? He's the literal fulfillment of that prophecy. And see, God is in absolute control of every single detail, even the donkey, which is a symbol of humility. Right? And so the time had arrived and I, I read to you the story, and we saw it from verse 1 to 3, where he tells his disciples to go find uh, in a village this donkey. So we'll go past that. Uh, and then verse 6, it says that the donkeys uh, went, and they did as Jesus told them, and that was fulfilled. And I always wondered about the, when someone asks, because they just went up to a donkey, and they just took it. And then if someone were to say, hey, what are you doing with my donkey? You know, it's like someone just, like, someone's driving down the street in a Mazda. Hey, wait a minute, that's my Mazda. Who, who told him to get it? Oh, the Lord needs it. Oh, you're good. We're chill. That's all right. Take my, my Mazda. Do you guys see that? The Lord has so much control over everything that he could go get something. And after all, not only did that donkey belong to the Lord, but all donkeys belong to the Lord. And, and well, everything belongs to the Lord. And so if he wants to use it. Boy, we, got no, we can't complain, can we? You know, 
my house is his house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I mean, uh, do we mean it or we just say it because it sounds good? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So your house and you serve the Lord? They belong to him then? Yeah, they do. How do you like driving the Lord's uh, tr truck, Ramito? How do you like that truck, the Lord's truck that you drive? You have a truck, right? Okay, okay, let's make sure. How do you like the Lord's house you live in? Pretty cool house, huh? You get to live in it. It's really his. It belongs to the Lord. You know, th when I finally accept that this wallet belongs to the Lord, then I'm really making progress. Right? It's not mine. Okay, so. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Verse number uh, four. And the interesting thing there is the king is coming and we're sitting in the very same position but now he's coming a second time. We're in the very same place they are in 21st century uh, America. We're also waiting for the king to come. But the difference will be when he comes the second time, he's coming the way they thought he was coming, the, should have come the first time as a conquering king. But not the first time. He came how humble. He came as a humble king. And the donkey is symbolic and represents to them when they see it that their expectations were false. They were mistaken in their ambitions. Right? See, because the animal is, again, it represents humility and peace. And he doesn't ride in uh, with majesty, but rather he rides in. Listen, the donkey, as he comes in in humility, means that Jesus, and thank God this is how he came, he comes in uh, with mercy and love and grace and, of course, sacrifice. That's how he comes. Amen? And they cry out, Hosanna! Not knowing that's how he's coming, thinking he's going to deliver him from Rome. And you know what Hosanna means in, in the Hebrew? It means, Lord, save us now. Deliver us now. Rescue us now. Help us now. Give us victory now. That's in Psalms 118, verse 25. It was a prayer of praise when they sang Hosanna. Right? And so, and then they use the term, the son of David. Notice that it also is mentioned in the text. Son of David, right? Why son of David? Because it's a title that the Jews use to refer to the coming Messiah. The eternal king. Hosanna. Son of David. These are all terms that are not in there by accident. And so, he, the military conqueror that they expected... To ride in on a black stallion and not on a donkey kind of confuses them. Well, it would be like if the president or a king, I don't know, a, a queen of England, you know, a leader like that. Th when they come into your town, if they were to show up here in Rialto, we expect to see them in a beautiful Lincoln Continental limousine. You know, surrounded by all these SUVs or whatever with Secret Service. And instead, it would be like, here comes Biden. And <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be nice. But I'm going to say it to relate to this. Riding in, coming to Rialto in a Volkswagen, a Bocho. Can you imagine? What? That's the president? Yeah. They're like, I'm confused. He's the leader of the free world, the most powerful nation on, on the planet. And he's right, coming in and riding in on a Volkswagen. That's what happened. And so that military conquer is what they were expecting. Like Enoch uh, addresses in Jude verse 14 and 15. And it was said about uh, these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. See, this is something they expected all the way back to Enoch. The seventh generation from Adam. Early in scripture we hear of this conquering king. He, he says the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones or saints. 
That's when we come back with Jesus riding on white horses. And what is it, what's he going to do when he comes? What are we going to do when we come back with Jesus? This is what they were expecting. To execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds and ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jesus is coming one day as a hungry king. He just didn't come that way that day. Why? Because his purpose is not to conquer Rome. His purpose was to conquer the hearts of sinful man and to break the power of sin over us. That's how he came. He came to conquer our souls. So no nationalistic aspirations no military interventions no political priorities here at all no economic utopian projects of promises or deals no social agenda Just nothing he came humble riding on a beast of burden to save to save us from our sins. I love it. I love it. I think it's awesome. And so they didn't see anything kingly in him at all uh, since he was riding on that donkey. But we know and we see the real Jesus. Amen? He's, he, is, he is a sovereign king. He chose that path. Willingly for our benefit. He humbled himself. He sa- he's the one who says, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, right? Because there are people that aspire to greatness. But he said, it doesn't work the way the world works. Then you must be the greatest of servants. If you want to be number one, then you got to be last. That's how it works in this kingdom. And it wasn't just uh, Jesus spewing out these uh, poetic words and these philosophical terms. He literally became that. The King of kings and the Lord of lords became a suffering servant. He became nothing. And one of the Psalms, it says, and it refers to the cross and the crucifixion, and it cries out, I am a worm. Now, by the way, interestingly enough, in the psalm, when it refers to the worm, the worm was usually crushed so they could get the scarlet dye. So he's referring to the, not only the, that he's crushed, but he's referring to his shed blood prophetically. And he's referring to the fact that he went as low as a worm. The one who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he did it for us. That was the only way in which we could be justified. In other words, the only way that we could be reconciled with the Father is through the work, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, where He came and He paid the debt that we could not pay. Wow, what great love and mercy is that? Thank God He rode in on a donkey. Amen? So, everyone there... um, is expecting something else. Yet Jesus comes, not afraid of the priests and the Pharisees and of the, the courts that are going to judge him. They, he knows they're plotting to kill him. Just give you a little bit of background of what he knew he was getting into. He, he openly comes into the city and he receives the praise of the people. Uh, Do you remember when Jesus healed, when Jesus was in his ministry, how often he told him, hey, don't tell anyone? Why? Because it wasn't his time. Because if it were revealed, if he were to openly acknowledge and accept the praises, he would be the target for blasphemy. And it wasn't ready for that to happen. And so when he comes into Jerusalem, he's going to force their hands. In other words, he's going to... them to act and to respond in a way where publicly they're going to have to judge him and they're going to eventually uh, 
try him as a criminal. He knew their hearts. And God, this is the amazing thing, he takes the worst of us and uses it to fulfill his will. And we get the best of him out of the worst of us when he goes to the cross. Amen? That's why he went into Jerusalem. He played their hand. Can you imagine if you knew what hand in a poker game you say, oh, pastor, why are you using a poker game as an example? Because it makes sense. You knew already what they had. You know what he was doing? He was getting ready to say, checkmate. You think you're putting me down? Satan believed he was getting rid of Jesus? No. He was using it to fulfill to go to the cross as our sacrifice. So at this time, he takes the praise, which he deserved because he is the king. He receives it. And remember what they told Jesus in another passage when the disciples and the crowd begin to sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They say, tell him to keep quiet. Oh my goodness, don't, don't say that. It's blasphemy. And he says, if they don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. So, Jesus, he's the only one in the whole parade that knew why he was there. And his Father in heaven, obviously, in the Holy Spirit. He's the one who knew that he had a mission to complete. And that everyone else had false expectations and mistaken agendas. But Calvary's cross was his destination. And he went there. And that's what this week is about, church. Let us celebrate the fact that Jesus was faithful to complete the plan that the Father had for him. And let him, the Jesus that comes on that donkey that day, be the one that you now expect. And the one that you know personally because you have allowed him to conquer your heart. Is he king of your heart? That's our desire. That's what we will most need before he can become anything else in our lives. He must be Savior. He must be the King of our heart. That's who rode into Jerusalem that day. Have you welcomed him into your heart? If you have, praise the Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads. That's my message. I think it's a wonderful message. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to see who he really is. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, because this week we're going to focus on exactly who Jesus is and why he came. And we're going to revisit over and over again and be thankful and grateful, Lord, for so great a salvation from so great a king. Help us, Lord, to understand uh, you, Lord, desire our hearts and you desire our praise. And you desire our praise in our hearts because we accept, Lord, so great a salvation from our Savior. We accept, Lord, that this is how you did it. And so, Lord, we receive you into our hearts again this morning. We praise you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, this week as we come back again on uh, Friday for Good Friday that we'll see one more time, uh, take a, a, a good, hard look at the cross and then again on Sunday, Lord, as we see your victory, as we see, Lord, that you conquer death and you conquer the consequences of sin, Lord, and we are victorious in Christ. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.